I send greetings to all of you across our Archdiocese of San Francisco and welcome you to the Archbishop's Annual Appeal. We hope in this brief program to share with you some of the ministries that your dollars and this campaign support. Our combined efforts help so many worthy causes, Catholic education, ministry for young adults, marriage and family life, ethnic ministries, priestly formation, and many others. I join with King David, who prays. You are my God, I give you thanks. My God, I offer you praise. As your bishop, I am continually inspired by and grateful for your generosity towards the works of God and the needs of the Archdiocese. It's easy for someone to say, I'm pro-life. It's much more challenging to commit to providing medical, financial, and emotional support throughout and beyond a real pregnancy. Currently, 15 archdiocesan parishes participate in the Gabriel Project, in which volunteers referred to as angels adopt a woman early in her pregnancy. This service is direct, personal, and literally a matter of life or death for the mother-to-be and her child. Your generosity in response to this year's appeal encourages the development and strengthening of the culture of life throughout our archdiocese. I was six months pregnant. My fiance and I were struggling with housing and money and really needed anything that would help us with the baby. One of my social workers had referred me to Gabriel Project. The Gabriel Project is a parish-based ministry to help pregnant mothers in need. We assign uh, mentors, we call angels, to assist the mother throughout her pregnancy and somewhat beyond. I'd call the 800 number and one of the angels was able to set up an interview with me. Many of the women who call us are under some kind of a duress. They don't have any support at all from their family. In fact, they have been rejected by their families. I wasn't embarrassed to make the call because I knew it's people trying to help out with my baby and myself. It could be helping them find housing. It could be helping them with food. It could be helping them with materials for their babies. We were at the hospital when she had the baby. To see the baby in a mother's hand is like God's perfect love for humanity. So she called me and uh, the first thing she needs is a shelter. We get together every first Saturday of the month. It's very important to get the parishioners involved because a small team of angels, it could be two to ten, they represent the pastor, they represent the parish community, and they represent Jesus Christ. It's good to get the mothers this kind of formula. The angels in our parish are both men and women. This ministry is not just a, uh, a Good Samaritan thing in a secular way. It's basically really true Christian discipleship because they were really hands-on as mentors. They were so kind-hearted and they were really willing to listen out to my needs and what I need help with. These angels are very special. Many people don't realize how much their help is needed. Any person, man or woman, can become an angel. I love babies. And when I retired, I told myself I should spend some time for the work of the Lord. And the Gabriel Project gave me that opportunity. Alex and I want to go to school, so both of us are looking forward to start a career. Ruby is now a year and a month. She's growing, and every time she does see one of the angels, she gets excited. My faith has definitely grown with God. The Gabriel Project has been amazing. With their support, we're able to really appreciate the blessing God has given us both. The notion of justice in ancient times called for an eye for an eye. Jesus, who moves us in his mercy, commands each of us to forgive those who harm us. 
Restorative justice through a ministry of presence helps victims of violence find a sense of peace and forgiveness. Through prayer circles and compassionate listening, this ministry allows those harmed by others to repair broken relationships and to forgive their enemies in a true gospel spirit. We are gathered here in love as a community in much grief. All of us are called to serve those that have committed crimes and those that have been affected by crime. Therefore, as a Catholic, it's a responsibility. Restorative justice is a way to approach harm caused by people in the community. There is no way to sugarcoat it. This world has much sin and much hatred. How do we respond to it? For the victims' families, restorative justice becomes a ministry of presence. We become present on the streets, and the community feels that someone cares. For the community to come together, we can choose to take charge of things and to use the power God gives each of us to do something about this. The prayer circles begin at a place where someone dies. Sometimes the best definition of justice I know is it's just us, and that's got to be the starting place. Most people, including the family, live with the sense of hope because we've left a message of faith and love where the person has died. My son was shot to death. In 15 years already, but still, it's there. It's hard. I'm going to Juvenile Hall. Esperanza's son resurrected in her and that's why she decided to go and visit young people in jail. She will speak to them about the truth, right and wrong, their decisions and their consequences. I go like with no spirit to talk, but when we started reading as a group, the spirit come, try to avoid the dangerous. Do it before it's too late. When we become present is when they have an opportunity to repent and go through a process of repairing their lives. They can change. And I know for sure more than one is going to be walking in the right path one day. When somebody comes out of juvenile hall, if they met God, then they're ready for any circumstances that may happen in their lives. Restored justice brings to the community a sense of peace and justice. Years ago, Catholic education was confined to the four walls of the classroom. Today, Catholic school students are challenged to connect the dots in their lives between theology and everyday life. At Sacred Heart Cathedral Prep, students not only attend religious studies classes, but carry its principles outward in service learning settings. Young Catholics are learning how to take Christ's words to heart. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. How do we know this is good with moral law or this is good with natural law? All students take a class in ethics and morality. Since they are natural laws, we feel a need to abide by them. Okay, right. The uh, basic other... premise that we're working with is connecting the theological teachings about moral law, natural law, ultimately eternal law. And we bring together these elements and we test them against the reality of the life that our students live outside of the classroom. So now we get into guilt. We take the four-wall classroom experience out to the community, and that's our lab. There are people in our community that have greater needs. One way to respond to the need is by volunteering. We went to Project Open Hand, which is an amazing organization that does food outreach in San Francisco. Students always go to volunteer together. It's about building community. Christ's message is about justice and love, fairness. We take that message very seriously. It seems like something that's really We can't easy. just preach that we need to help people. We need to actually go do it. When I was hungry, you gave me bread. This so-called bread could easily be representing time to help somebody else. 
I really think that it's our duty and responsibility to help people. They have this power to give. I have plenty of time to go and do service, and I have plenty of resources to help these people. Our hope is that when they move from the four walls of the school, they want to be a person of service. So we show them how to choose that lifestyle. It's embedded in everything we do. If it can make someone else's life brighter, why would I miss that opportunity? The Catholic priest is often referred to as an alter Christus, that is, another Christ. The transformation of a young man into an ordained priest requires years of study and spiritual formation before he is able to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ and celebrate the sacraments. Your support of the Archbishop's Annual Appeal provides seminary training and formation at St. Patrick's Seminary in Menlo Park where young men prepare for their priestly ministry in our archdiocese. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Being a priest is a wonderful work of God, but vocation grows from having an active participation in the church and letting the church feed us. The body of Christ. I started to feel that I really was called to become a priest until I was in the first year of theology. I entered the seminary to discern and to find out what God had for me. God is calling me to the priesthood. He has shown that throughout my life. I was born and raised in San Francisco. I was influenced very much by my family, in particular by my grandmother. She's the one who really taught me how to pray, brought me to mass. She's really the one who inspired me. I get up about 6.45, morning prayer starts at 7.30. I enjoy prayer very much. It's very necessary in my life. It's very important to listen to the voice of God, to listen to what He's calling you to. Then we have breakfast together as a community. Studying really hard, Alvin. I <laughs> am. There are a number of guys studying in my class. They come from all different areas in the West Coast. It's a great community here. The first class starts at 9.40 and I have class throughout the day. That chapter is on the implicit Christology of the Synoptic Gospel. We need to study philosophy and also theology. So after second theology, I'll be going to my pastoral year. And after pastoral year, I'll be going to third and fourth theology. So that's kind of the road ahead of me. I think we're all called to service, whether we're called to become priests, sisters, married life, or so forth. We're all called to give up ourselves, modeled after Christ who came to serve and not to be served. We've just witnessed a small glimpse of some of the wonderful ministries that unfold across the Archdiocese of San Francisco every day. Your generosity helps to make this good work possible. As stewards of God's blessings to us, we know that the real joy comes from returning those blessings to Him with increase. That's why the classic prayer which is associated with our patron, St. Francis of Assisi, may be an old saying, but it's new every time we experience it. It is in giving that we receive. May we open our hearts to be generous stewards in sharing God's love with those around us through these and other ministries throughout our Archdiocese. I thank you for your support and pray God's blessings upon you and your loved ones. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.